Apart from being another landmark bar setting expansion, Forsaken ushered in a brand new style of content releases back in 2018 that many live service games would go on to mimic in the coming years, while borrowing some ideas from a couple other trend setting live service games as well. In terms of history, Forsaken stands alone as the only expansion to only get three true seasonal content drops, as players had more than enough to do during the first three months of the expansion's release, which is technically known as Season of the Outlaw. In subsequent expansions, lighter, less content-rich seasons would typically release to supplement the expansions themselves to help alleviate expectations players had for each yearly content drop. Forsaken was big enough that it didn't need it. And not only that, some of these seasons were co-developed by other Activision-owned studios such as Vicarious Visions, in an effort to aid what was at the time a significantly smaller bungee than the one we know today. First of these three content drops beginning on December 4th, 2018 was Season of the Forge, also known as Black Armory. This season saw players meeting with a new EXO known as Ada One, the keeper of the secrets of the Black Armory. Ada One was initially a rather hostile and impatient character character who reluctantly enlists the Guardians to help her free the many forges of the Black Armory stationed on Earth and Nessus that were being taken by the Red Legion for the purposes of reinvigorating their own war effort. In exchange, we were allowed to use the forges to craft and discover entirely new and powerful weapons that had never been seen before. While this included a host of beloved and interesting legendary weapons, there were three new exotic weapons that were also craftable by various means from each of these locations. Jotun, Lamanark and Izanagi's Burden. The Volunder Forge was the first of these forges, found on the EDZ and sequestered deeply beneath Firebase Hades, while the two forges on Nessus, the Gofanon and Izanami Forges, were carried there by the same Exodus Black that the failsafe AI that players met during the Vanilla Campaign resided within. The culmination of these events came with Niobe Labs, a secret vault created by the Armory through which players had to solve puzzles using the various weapons they'd collected up to that point to unlock the final and the most powerful forge, the Bergusia Forge. At the time, Niobe Labs was itself infamous, as the Bergusia Forge was made inaccessible to the entire player base until at least one team had beaten it, and Bungie accidentally neglected to reveal a crucial clue for completing Niobe Labs until teams were already several hours into the run. That said, it was still a memorable and unique puzzle dungeon that to this day stands alone in its creativity. Alongside all of this also came an exotic mission for the returning hand cannon, The Last Word, which saw players going through a special variant of the locations in the Broodhold Strike. But most notably of all was an entirely new raid just a few months after the release of Last Wish. This raid was known as Scourge of the Past and saw players making their way through a ruined and uninhabitable portion of the last city to put a stop to a fallen crime syndicate's attempts to steal the contents of Vault Ibisu, where the Black Armory holds a whole host of weapons and resources that the Fallen could use to unleash anarchy on the city. Hence the name of the exotic grenade launcher obtainable within this raid, Anarchy. This raid, while a bit on the shorter side, consists of a sparrow section and a huge burned out city block where players did battle with a big servitor piloting a mech suit, and is to this day highly regarded as one of the most high energy raids Destiny's ever had, and certainly for the better. Season of the Forge came to an end on March 5th, 2019, and was subsequently followed by Season of the Drifter. Without a doubt, the most controversial and least beloved season of the year was Season of the Drifter, also known as Joker's Wild. Season of the Drifter was primarily focused around the harbinger of Gambit himself, the Drifter, and thus was very much focused on the game mode in question. With this season came a revamped version of Gambit known as Gambit Prime, which changed the original best of three format to a single longer round that prevented players from blitzing the boss's health down due to health gating and additional objectives. It also introduced role-specific armor sets that allowed players to focus on a particular aspect of the game mode, from collecting moats to slaying out enemies to defending the bank or invading and wiping out the other team. These armor sets, when fully powered up, allowed the wearers to have special bonuses, such as the invader set giving players a stronger overshield when invading, or collectors to increase their moat limit from 15 to 20, thus allowing them to drop extra chunky giant blockers on the enemy team. While a great idea in theory, many of these changes and bonuses created huge power imbalances that made Gambit Prime largely inaccessible to players who didn't go all in on these systems. And while Gambit was generally accepted and tolerated up to this point after an initial wave of positivity, Prime was sort of the catalyst that caused a large percentage of the player base to sour on the game mode altogether. Eventually, Bungie would respond to these criticisms by merging the two modes to remove all of the most unpopular gameplay features from both, while making games faster and more balanced. 
But there also had to be something for the story crowd, so Gambit wasn't the only game mode that got attention. Within the Drifter's Derelict, which is the name of his ship, is a portal that allows players to travel to the realm of the Nine, the very Nine that Squid Face extraordinaire Zur himself answers to. Inside this realm, we don't actually meet the Nine, but we do meet their emissary, whom we learn more about over the course of the season, and her history as a human, later an Awoken, eventually a Guardian, and finally the voice of the Nine themselves. The game mode here is called Reckoning, a four-player activity that consists of three tiers and three phases. At Tier 1, players would only experience the first phase, while Tiers 2 and 3 would feature all three phases, but the third tier featured stronger enemies and a boss with a lot more health, but better chances at better rewards for your additional trouble. The first phase would take place in a wide open space where you'd be asked to kill enough taken enemies within a certain time limit. The second phase saw players advance their way up a bridge, capturing zones as they made their way further up, while fighting off a constant onslaught of enemies in a fashion that was really only doable at the time due to the insane amount of super ability regen that players had access to back then. This section was particularly unforgiving too, as if even two players stepped out of the capture zone for more than a few seconds for whatever reason, especially if they all died, it was impossible to recover and players would often fail here. If they could make it to the third phase, they would face off against one of two bosses depending on the week. A likeness of Oryx, not unlike the shades of Oryx players fought all the way back in Taken King, or a likeness of Nocris, a wizard that players would have to take down within a very dark arena as Hive Knights with axes, much like those in the Duel and Karu fight in the Shattered Throne, would chase players around the room. However, by far the most beloved event of the season was the Zero Hour Mission, a timed 20-minute romp through and underneath the ruins of the old Destiny 1 tower that saw players rushing to take down a big fallen captain who's out trying to steal old Guardian equipment left behind within the ruins. This mission has us meeting a friendly fallen character for the first time since Varix way back in House of Wolves, as well as receiving foreshadowing for events that wouldn't take place until Beyond Light more than a year and a half later. The reward for finishing this mission was a beefed up, more complete version of the old Wrath of the Machine raid exotic Outbreak Prime, now dubbed Outbreak Perfected. Season of the Drifter also saw the release of two more exotics, the first special ammo-based linear fusion rifle, Arbalest, and the return of the both greatly beloved and greatly despised Destiny 1 hand cannon, Thorn. Season of the Drifter came to an end on June 4th, 2019, and after this came the final season of the year, Season of Opulence. Fondly remembered as perhaps the greatest season that Destiny ever got, Season of Opulence, also known as Penumbra, was the swan song for Destiny under the control of Activision as a publisher and under the direct assistance and supervision of Vicarious Visions, as Bungie had by this point been many months into the process of splitting from Activision and going entirely independent. Season of Opulence saw Guardians being contacted by Callus, the Emperor of the Cabal and the subject of the vanilla Destiny 2 raid, Leviathan. Callus invited Guardians in for an opportunity of wealth within his menagerie a six-player match-made activity with a whole host of different encounter types and varying gameplay that players could experience at random in order to obtain the huge bounty of loot within. Players would reach the final boss by completing a certain amount of challenges successfully, which would cause them to fill up a progress bar. Once the bar was nearly filled, the boss fight would begin, and as players got collectively more efficient, this in turn made menagerie encounters shorter and shorter. After the boss had been defeated, players had the option to combine runes to determine which weapons and armor would be rewarded to them. With all the many different combinations, every single piece from five different armor sets, including one entirely new one, as well as 24 different weapons could be farmed from these encounters, leading this activity to be by far the most reliable and interesting way to chase armor stat rolls and certain weapon rolls for many of the best pieces of legendary gear in the game. But for all of Callus's perceived altruism, all was not as it seemed, as players would discover throughout the season that Callus was indeed a devil that players were making a deal with. We would learn that Callus was in fact offering us gifts to entice us to join him in his alliance with the Darkness, and that the seemingly wronged and hurt former Emperor of the Cabal was himself no better than his usurper Gaul. This culminated in yet another raid, the only time in Destiny's history where three raids would be released in the span of a year, and this raid was known as Crown of Sorrow. Within the the Leviathan, and with the help of an ancient artifact, the Hive had begun to infest Callus' ship, and so he tasks Guardians with clearing them out. But very quickly we discover that Callus is the one who brought them aboard this ship in the first place, as he is the one who took the Crown of Sorrow, but in doing so, the crown was affixed to one of his loyalists' head, and this loyalist, known as Galran, is the one leading the Hive in their slaughter and mayhem. Another shorter raid, and perhaps not quite as beloved as Scourge of the Past, Crown of Sorrow was still a very unique raid, marked
marred only by the lack of creativity in the designs of its various weapons, but was nonetheless a hit at the time and simply added on to an already fantastic and much celebrated season. Another thing this season added was the Tribute Hall, a place where players could store and bask in their own achievements given to them by Callus. As players completed Triumphs, a whole host of which that could be gotten all across the game, not just within the season of Opulence, they could unlock statues and rewards and ammo stores for their upcoming missions, as well as even enemy projections for weapon and damage testing. Once players had unlocked 18 of these tributes, a mission known as the Other Side became available for players to complete, located entirely within the Ascendant Realm that rewarded them with the returning Bad Juju Exotic Pulse Rifle. While not as beloved as Zero Hour or the Whisper of the Worm Exotic Mission, it was still a decent challenge that gave players a taste of things to come in later seasons. Players also got a quest for an entirely new and interesting exotic hand cannon known as Lumina, which is the first healing weapon Destiny's ever received, allowing players to fire bursts of health towards friendly guardians after downing enemies, a behavior almost exactly inverse with the hand cannon Thorn. This quest saw players nurturing and growing a very basic legendary weapon known as Rose and eventually crafting their own exotic out of it. The final exotic released during this season was the returning Truth, the exotic rocket launcher from Destiny 1 that could hold three in the tube and track very aggressively. Its behavior did not change one bit. Season of Opulence came to an end on September 30th, 2019, with the release of the following expansion, Shadowkeep. And that was the first year of proper seasonal content in Destiny. These three seasons stand out because they are actually treated more like mini expansions in hindsight. They are talked about with the caveat that much larger development teams worked on these content drops. And even though Bungie was largely still trying to get their bearings on the whole content model, these seasons do not give you a very good or clear picture of how this model will continue to behave in the following years. Truthfully, it's the very next season, the one that came with Shadowkeep, Season of the Undying, that laid the foundation and blueprint for how seasons would continue to behave all the way up through the current day. And we'll talk about that one, as well as Seasons of the Dawn, Worthy, and Arrivals, once we reach the end of the Shadowkeep expansion and just before we begin Beyond Light. Thank you all so very much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.